Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we speak with former U.S. military remote viewer Lynn Buchanan. Lynn is also a linguist, author, and systems designer. Since his retirement from the military, he has been training controlled remote viewers around the world. Lynn Buchanan, thank you very much for your time. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. So I've, uh, I, I know your reputation precedes you, Lynn. Uh, and as a result, having read uh, quite a bit of your material, I'm looking forward to the answer to the traditional question one. Lynn, were you a weird kid? <laughs> uh, no. I was, um, in fact, I was giving a talk one time to a psychiatrist convention, and I said, uh, I have a problem that most of you have never dealt with, and you could see their eyes roll back. And I said, I was raised happy and healthy. (laughs) And most of them have agreed, you know, uh, we've never dealt with that before. Um, No, I had a very good childhood. Um, There were um, a few times when something strange would happen. But instead of dismissing it, I was always curious, you know, and um, uh, there were a couple of times when some PK events happened. And instead of dismissing them or getting scared of them or or something, I I tried to see how they worked and, you know, uh, started playing with them as toys. And... uh, developing them and then uh a uh i was showing off one of these talents you know of of doing a pk thing uh for the cute little red-headed girl uh my life parallels charlie brown's in a lot of ways nice. and uh um she went home and told her father the pentecostal minister and the next day, as I was going home from school, he and three of his deacons met me on the on the street on the way home, you know. And um, he asked me to show him. He said he was very interested, and, you know, he seemed interested in all that. And I showed him, and all of a sudden, they had me down on the sidewalk, pressing my head into the pavement, and screaming for the devil to come out of me and and so on and uh, i it had never even occurred to me that this might be something evil but um you know i was i was raised in the in a hard baptist church and uh, if the preacher said it then god said it so here was this preacher telling me that i was I was a son of Satan and all. And so um, I did everything I could to to stop doing that. And yet the talent had developed. And so I was plagued with these events all through life. But, um, you know, other than that, no, I was uh, was just one of the kids. Well, you say that, but you did write poetry. Well, yeah, I love writing poetry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know why I love writing poetry? Go on. It's it's because I don't like to read long stuff. And if you can tell a story in 15 lines, why read 150 pages? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I hated reading, so anything I wrote, I just made it short. <laughs> So the um the sort of PK effects that you found you had some control over is 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 maybe not the right way to describe it, but you had some capacity for as a child. I mean, did you you obviously didn't mention these things to your parents or discuss it with them prior to being effectively assaulted by some adults on the street? Uh, as a kid? Yeah, yeah, and my mother was very supportive of it. My father just sort of uh uh you know looked at me sideways and change the subject but uh my mother was very supportive of it and uh was there uh, did she mention or are you aware of any kind of uh, family tradition in that area 
Well, I never got away with anything as a kid. <laughs> you know, the old thing, your mother has eyes in the back of her head. I, I kind of started believing it. I mean, I couldn't get away with a thing. So you suspect that even if she was unaware of that, like there's potentially a uh, a family component to having, you know, talent in this area in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, I think there may have been, yeah. Uh, not talked about or even mentioned or anything I ever heard of. But um, I know my grandfather was a uh, Methodist minister and was very good at, um, they said, knowing what's coming next. Um, yeah, that sounds that's, like... Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reading reading between the lines, that sounds like there's this thing there. Funnily enough, and obviously we'll get further into this story later on, I can't remember who said it, but there was an ex-Soviet guy who um, basically said the reason the Russians got there first and were um, better at the kind of psychic spying for longer was because Russia never burned its witches. And it's an interesting way of thinking about how these skills, which may have some genetic components, uh, can grow better in cultures that aren't necessarily antithetical to them? Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, I tracked it down as well as I could and found out that um, Hitler had a project where he was delving into all of this. And uh, from what I've been able to find out, he had called the project Dr. Grinbaum, which means green tree. And um, he was very interested in the Kabbalah. And, of course, the green tree of life is the central figure in the Kabbalah. And um, he had a lot of projects going like that and mind control projects. And, you know, it, it sort of developed it all into one mass thing. And um, when he lost World War II, we took the nuclear scientists, the rocket scientists and all that. So did Great Britain and France. But nobody wanted all that psychic stuff, you know. And um, Russia wanted it, and um, they took uh, they took what Hitler had, and evidently started uh, developing it into a science. And uh, I met at one time. I met one of the people who had been in that project. He didn't really talk about it, but he said, "Yeah, they uh, they tried." just about everything and kept data and I would love to get my hands on that data, but probably yeah, never will. No, it's uh, it, it is fascinating. Some of the things um, that went on, on, on that side of the iron curtain from a science perspective, oh, because yeah. the worldview was so, was so different. So they got to work with, uh, you know, how large pyramids affect the crop growth and, and all this kind of stuff, which you just not get funding for uh, in, in the right. West. And, and you think yeah. what that information, obviously, I'm not saying the theories are correct, but that information, that those data are there somewhere for, uh, for someone to pick up. And it's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, and that data is there because someone had an interest in it and someone had an interest in it because there had been some kind of an experience that something happens. And uh, and so, you know, you can't rule it out. No, absolutely. That's even if how they describe it in, say, the 60s is, you know, the science has moved on from them, the experience or the, the sort of evidence from the experiments is still legitimate. It just needs to be kind of potentially remodeled or built on to, to kind of improve the accuracy of what it implies. And uh, That's there's, right. there's a kind of... Yeah, there, there's a large missed opportunity of, well, currently missed uh, or uncapitalized upon opportunity uh, in, in some of the stuff that was going on on, on that side of the game. Right. And uh, I know in the U.S., uh, I'm not sure how it is in Australia, but in, in the U.S., um, you can show them proof, I mean, proof positive that the uh, controlled remote viewing used by the military works. And they, they find such ridiculous uh, reasons not to believe it. That, uh, and, or they get very belligerent. They get angry. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I never have figured out what causes the anger. 
Um, I think about that a lot because obviously this podcast is about things like the paranormal and so on. And what you're essentially doing, um, you're you're attacking their entire reality because this is the piece. Oh, yeah. This is the piece that breaks everything. So that they have to reconsider how to get <laughs> home, how to get home from the office. Like you, you, if they let that in, everything comes tumbling down. And uh, and That's the, right. the yeah. reality is you actually are never going to fix that. So my father's a psychiatrist and he has this joke, which isn't funny, like all doctor jokes, but mm -hmm. it is how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's when you deal with these people, you just got to work out what kind of light bulb they are. And, uh, and if not, yeah. you just move past them. And I think one of the exciting things, and this happened and we'll get to the story about remote viewing in general from the mid-90s on, is it kind of came out at the same time as digital technologies enable people of of like mind or even just interest. They don't have to be like-minded to uh, examine the data for themselves and communicate and and try it out. So there, there are sort of ways around the intransigent light bulbs now, which means that it's potentially quite exciting in the medium term. It really is, yeah. Um, I realized early on that... Um, that if, well, let me back back to the start of this thought. Um, I have had so many people say, prove it to me. Now, that means do their homework for them. Yep. And, um, and it dawned on me, there are over 7 billion people in the world, and everyone wants to not read the proof, but have you prove it to them individually and then their friend comes in because they heard about that oh now then you have to prove it to me and i could spend the rest of my life proving it and uh, you know and that's not what i wanted to do i was over in australia in uh, perth teaching a class and i was called by a um oh i forget the name of the magazine it was a men's magazine uh, um, and they wanted me to do a, um, a dog and pony show, you know, for yeah. the, uh, for an article. And I said, well, I don't want to show people that I can do this because that makes me, you know, but I said, I'm just a soldier that they grabbed, you know, out of the military and taught this to. And, um, uh, what I want to prove is that anybody can do it. So. I told the guy, ask around your office, find somebody who has never had a psychic experience in their life, loan them to me for an hour or so, I'll send them back, and you pick a target, I won't have anything to do with it, they'll do what I teach, and see how well they do. And uh, the guy nailed it. I mean, he nailed the target. And the article came out showing, you know, actually that anybody could do this, which is what I've been wanting to tell people all along. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, the dog and pony show. It's um, very frustrating if if, they, if they're not a man because they've pre-written the article. If um, if they say, well, why don't you do this? And you can kind of see exactly what oh, the yeah. end product will mm -hmm. be. And it's very lazy journalism, <laughs> right? Uh, yes, it is. If, and if they don't want to do the work themselves, they just say, well. These are my corporate rates. Uh, if oh, you'd yeah. like to, <laughs> if you'd like and, to pay me to do some of this work, this is uh, this is what it costs. And all of a sudden, you hear a click on the yeah. phone. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, let's uh, let's pick up the the biographical journey again. Uh, so you had, uh, to your own satisfaction, you demonstrated some psychokinetic capacity as a kid which you then suppressed and uh, or just ignored is a better way of describing uh, it well no i actively tried to suppress it okay um anytime i lose my temper something usually it would usually come out yeah right uh did that mean was that awareness in the back of your head when you were deciding kind of what shall i do with my life or were you always going to always going to join the military regardless of you know, whether these sort of things are real? No, um, I was um, teaching in East Texas, teaching high school, and um, I had been in the service as a, a guided missile uh, expert. And um, I'd gotten out of the service, 
gone to gone to East Texas and started teaching high school, and um, we had this um, high school superintendent that I caught beating up one of the kids, and uh, I had this big political thing, and it wound up him getting fired and me um, getting asked to leave town, you know. And so I went ahead and joined the army again as a linguist, a Russian linguist. Uh, I speak about six different languages. And uh, and then uh, they sent me over to Germany to pick up Russian intercept. And um, it was in Germany that a um, the opportunity came to uh, write a special program that tied uh, 12 countries computers together we had 12 different countries represented in the field station and uh, all their computers used different fonts you know uh, worked differently and all that and so um, I wrote a program that tied them all together uh, this other sergeant had been turned down for the opportunity to write this program so when I got it written um, I was to give a demonstration, and um, uh, I set the computer up. It was a big mainframe computer. Set the computer up, and uh, I went out, went to the bathroom to make sure my hair was in place and the creases in my pants, you know, there were no wrinkles in my shirt and things like that. Went back in gave my little song and dance to these um, uh, generals who were from, you know, each of the different countries. And um, uh, hit the button, and the whole screen just went blank. And I turned around, and here was this other sergeant in the back of the room standing there at the door. He pointed, and he mouthed, gotcha grinned and turned around and walked out and I got flaming mad when I did the entire uh, intelligence computers of the field station just went out stopped working and um, for a time that was still it's still classified we had no intelligence uh, collection and um, found out years later that across the border um, in both Russia and East Germany, um, theirs had gone out too. <laughs> so uh, It's just such a classic uh, Cold War story because you, you talk about this at the Seventh Sense, that uh, yeah. both sides were going about their business pretending that they were still capturing uh, information and, and going to the office and, and what have you because – both side satellites were watching the other one, and it's, oh yeah, it's, uh, that's there's a that's just so classically Cold War, isn't it? It is. <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know, uh, in the back of the room, this captain had wanted to see all these this gaggle of generals, you know, all in one place, and so he was just touring the station and had nothing to do with anything like that. Well, he had been trained by General Stubblebein, who was over the uh, uh, human, intelligence, human intelligence collection effort. And um, he had been trained to spot psychic events because General Stubblebein was interested in that. And um, and just to so interrupt he, there, Lynn, that the the uh, this is something that's worth talking about. The interest within the U.S. military and NATO allies uh, in this kind of stuff most likely emerged from a realization that the the Soviets, the Russians, had a program of their own, and and so it was like, well, what do we do? That was essentially why they were kind of combing through the actual yeah. armed forces for people with some talent. Yeah, and uh, what. What bothered him most is that uh, the Russian effort worked, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know the and the intelligence um, uh, community is not one that says, "Oh gosh, that worked." Oh, panic, panic, panic. They're the ones that say, 
oh, that works. Hey, let's get it and use it if it works, you know. And because uh, they're always on the lookout for anything that that will help collect intelligence. And so um, they, uh, of course, couldn't get it from the Russians. And so they had to start their own effort. And um, and the effort that they had had, the remote viewing unit, had been in operation for 10 years before General Stubblebine ever came to uh, the field station out there, got me over to one side and, well, drew me into the commander's office, got right up in my face and said, did you kill my computers with your mind? And I could just see my great grandkids still paying for computers, but I said, yes, sir, I did. And this grin went across his face and he said, far effing out, have I ever got a job for you? He took me back to D.C., uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, he wanted to start a unit that would destroy our enemy computers with the, hopefully, the final goal of learning how to control the data within those computers so that if they fired a missile at us, we could make it turn around and go back or drop into the sea or whatever. And um, Congress thought that was mind control. And so they said, absolutely not. We will not fund it. Well, General Stobobine had nothing for me to do. Uh, so he took me out to Fort Meade to this remote viewing unit and put me into there. And uh, when they read me on to what they actually did as a unit, I thought, this is crazy. The The military doesn't do this, you know. And then I saw them work and saw how accurate they were. And I was just blown away by the whole thing. And I said, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I want to do this for the rest of my military career. You bet. Yeah. Uh, it's. What I think a lot of people, because many people, especially those who listen to this show, would be familiar with the kind of West Coast research kind of wing or lineage, if you will, of, of remote viewing, which is Dr. Targ and Dr. Putoff and and so yeah. on. But uh, the, the operational military stuff was uh, more or less East Coast, uh, and it has a different uh, sort of lineage as well and the two kind of come together with the the, the sort of multi-named projects particularly over the 80s but yeah. mm -hmm. the origin yeah. points are quite interesting i wonder if you would like to tell uh the story of um skip atwater's first target being the abrams tank and what happened yeah that was actually joe mcmonagle's uh skip uh developed the target but he he didn't remote view it um he gave it to joe mcmonagle and uh, it was the most secret project in the U.S. military at the time. And um, uh, Joe had no idea what it was. Um, what happened was um, uh, Skip gave him the geographic coordinates of the place of the uh, base where these tanks were being researched. Um, Joe had no idea what these coordinates were because it was a secret facility. And so he didn't know of any base that was it. And so he started describing this thing from the inside of the tank. And he actually drew the controls. Um, this was the first tank that had a TV screen in it. So that you know, it could it could look around on all sides and all that. He drew the TV screen. Uh, he drew everything as it was exactly on the inside of the tank, except for one of the problems that remote viewers have had all along. He drew it flipped left to right. And so everything that he drew on the right was on the left side in the tank, but uh, but he had everything totally accurate. And when that happened and they turned it in, um, from what I hear, uh, these black SUVs and, and, and black uh, 
unmarked vans came up and we were going to steal all of the records and haul the uh haul the you know the filing cabinets away and arrest everybody and uh and skip was able to prove that you know this was a military effort uh but there was there was evidently a lot of commotion over this because the people who were in the project had no idea that this was going to be done and all of a sudden here's their absolute top secret information sitting on a desk in Fort Meade, Maryland. <laughs> and uh, it yeah. had them worried. Well, yeah. it, there was – the first thought was obviously that there must have been a leak, so that's why you get the the black SUVs show up. So it definitely oh, – yeah. Yeah. It, it sets a cat amongst the pigeons, and it also kind of suggests that uh, after that point, what people consider – like strategically and militarily secret is uh, – Probably isn't, and that means that that means that kind of game changes. And I know you talk about how uh, it's possible, kind of possible, to do things like protect different concepts or locations or, or so on. But the reality is, you're kind of in a in a constant game of one-upmanship when you're when you're dealing with protecting and your secrets and viewing the other team's secrets and so on. Yeah, one of the uh, problems that we one of the standing orders that we had was to try to find a way to protect something from being remote viewed because we found out that there was no protection from it. And um, and so if there's no protection from it and the method we were using gets out to other countries, then, you know, um, goodbye secrets. But um, we, I and one of the other viewers worked a project where we um, uh, developed a way to protect things and um, and it worked um, so that was a standing standing order that we had is to find a way to do it however it's a very highly advanced form of uh, controlled remote viewing by the way let me explain something if you don't mind controlled remote viewing was developed in the laboratory it's largely based on the martial arts um, when we start teaching someone this we will say we'll give them a pen and paper and we'll say land and have them draw a straight line then we we'll say water and have them draw a wavy line and just like the kids in karate class that go, you know, wash on, wipe off and all, um, you do it until they are so bored that they can no longer pay attention to what they're doing. And that's just when their subconscious learns to attach a physical motion with a concept such as water. and. Um, and what you're doing from that point on is you're teaching their subconscious mind how to communicate with with graphic symbols. And um, so it's very largely, the CRV itself is not psychic. It's an interview and report process where you're using physical reactions to subconscious knowledge. Now, where the subconscious gets that knowledge We've never figured it out. We don't know. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. So there's that famous uh, Arthur C. Clarke thing about, you know, science and magic being indistinguishable. Yeah. Now, uh, there are practices within sort of 20th century esotericism, and I'll tell you one of them. It's called sort of sigil magic, but it's essentially a similar idea where you are communicating with your unconscious by uh, right. write, writing out statements and, and turning them into sigils and, and, and so on. And it, so it's a kind yes. of kissing cousin process to CRV in the sense that it doesn't have uh, – it, it doesn't require magical powers, if you will, to build a model for why it works. That's right. Uh, yeah, and I find I find that hugely interesting because it, well, one, it it does mean you can actually have the discussions within a military area where you're looking for funding, and you don't have to say, 
please give me money for my magical powers you can actually say well this right. is this is a kind of science <laughs> that uh we don't really know how it is and you push you push the astounding components of it into a discussion of the subconscious or unconscious which we've we will likely never get a handle on uh but it, right. it probably belongs in that area. But what I find yeah. fascinating about it, and you, you talk about this in the book, uh, you talk about what CRV's spin-offs are uh, and and a regular kind of engagement with sigils does the same thing. So if you want to talk about mm -hmm. what the what the spin-off process is, I think it says something interesting about our own unconscious. Yes, it does. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, well, where does the information come from? And I've had uh, radio interviewers and I'll just sort of be absolutely surprised when I don't come up with some woo-woo or, you know, uh, or something. And in fact, when when I give a talk, people come up afterwards and they say, well, where it comes from is holograms in the universe and I say, oh, well, thank you very much. I didn't know that. Or they'll come up and say, well, it comes from angels. And I'll say, oh, thank you very much. I didn't know that. Or it comes from whatever. And I always thank them for the information. But, you know, show me some proof. There's not any. <laughs> yeah, it's, and. Yeah. I, I yeah, get oh, I, this happens all the time. Carry on, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. People get an idea that seems logical to them as to where psychic information comes from. And I've seen this over and over that they cling to that definition or that uh, explanation as though they're lost at sea and it's the only thing that floats. I mean, they will never let it go. It's, it's the paradigm, you know, that you yeah. were talking about earlier. Um, it doesn't uh, pass the sniff test. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me about um, CRV or really the entire sort of multi-decade project is there isn't actually an observable overlap between... Uh, sort of demonstrated clairvoyant function and proficiency in CRV. Sure, a couple of the best ones um, had both, but there are mm -hmm. more examples of people who say, like, no, I, I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm useless with tarot cards. Um, I don't have <laughs> precognitive dreams, and and the method works. And what that suggests is a better, even in the short term, model of understanding it is this increased communication with the unconscious rather than. Magical absolutely. powers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I know when when all of this became declassified and came out to the uh, public, uh, people started asking me about, well, UFOs, and thank you for not doing that, um, UFOs and uh, uh, tarot cards and pendulums and and all this other stuff and uh, i know that for the people who work those they work but to me i have i have a method where at every point there is a step to take it's delineated i don't have to do any magic and uh, and i come up with usually better answers than then um, if I were to believe in the magic or, or you know, go into trances or, or something like that, um, I don't know how to work tarot cards or cast runes or use really use pendulums or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's I, a I process. sit down and do it. Yeah, it's a process that's just... Um... Uh, has that quintessential military pragmatism, which you you kind of find in the twentieth century, that sort of shut up and calculate model, which is yeah. um, the the worldview in which something like this works is irrelevant to the fact it works. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so go for it. So, um, there's a the guy like um, there's a author um, Peter J Carroll who sort of invented the. 20th century philosophy of chaos magic and he says magic works in practice but not in theory and uh and it's <laughs> it's largely this is sort of what we're talking about it's like uh particularly when you when you 
have actual Cold War targets to view. How yeah. it works is somebody else's problem. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for us, well, the people out on the West Coast, uh, Targ and put off and so forth, um, they were doing research and, in fact, some very good research into this out on the East Coast, out at Fort Meade, we were doing operations and um, and the process is very different. The, the basics of what was going on are the same. And most of the time, um, they were studying people in the lab. We were studying the world and, you know, uh, foreign politics and foreign militaries and all that over in an abandoned building over on Fort Meade's, over on the edge of Fort Meade. Um, so it was, it was quite a bit different. Um, I guess one, one of the sorry, things that, yeah. One of the things that bothers me these days is that when it came out uh, that controlled remote viewing was used by the military, was developed in the laboratory, and was proven to work, all of a sudden we had um, crystal ball remote viewers and palm remote viewers and tea leaf remote viewers and uh, everybody who does anything psychic started calling themselves remote viewers. And um, I have only one problem with that. And that is that when a person growing up, let's say, realizes that they do have psychic ability and they want to find out something about it, each one of those scrying and, you know, and all of these other fields have rich heritages of literature, you know, and experiences and all that. And they never get funneled into that. They get funneled into all of the craziness that's out on the internet as remote viewing. And uh, you may have a good, a fantastically natural map dowser who never really learns anything about map dowsing because they're off trying to master remote viewing and uh, yeah, 100% and I think that, agree and yes especially yeah. not plugging into the lineages it's very frustrating because it's uh yeah you know 100% agree there's um one of the kind of returning returning but modifying Arthur C Clark uh magic as i describe it is a sort of culture specific way of describing uh, naturally occurring consciousness effects. So things right. like, because there's not actually that many magical powers. I've kind of had this discussion with a number of guests before. There is um, whatever remote viewing is, there's telepathy, there's psychokinesis, yeah. mm -hmm. and there's essentially the other one, uh, the main one is some sort of um, after-death communication. And that is it, really. Yeah. And and they're, they're, you know, constellated in many exciting and different and actually quite, you know, beautiful ways in different cultures around the world. Because, but it, it appears to be how a culture engages with naturally functioning human consciousness. So if you don't plug, into, right, the, if yeah. you don't plug into the lineage, you're just doing some kind of late 20th century capitalist goo where you're sort of throwing in, yeah. uh, you know, angels and uh, crystal pendulums in with, with a scientific process and thinking it's um, something that the cunning men of Cornwall did for 300 years. And it's not like <laughs> every That's part right. of that is yeah. wrong. And uh, I, like positively, I mean, having been involved in this space for a while, uh, a slowly but surely, I think a lot of the nonsense is draining away and it is part of that connectivity that the internet affords now that yeah. more people are on it. So if you actually, and in, I, I kind of get a bit fatalistic about it. If you, if you're not willing to put in the effort of more than an eight minute Google search, then maybe it's not for you. So it's almost like the remaining goo at the front catches people like fly traps that um, yeah. probably aren't supposed to be beyond the fly trap. Yeah. Mm hmm. Nice one. Um, I want to go back to because this is the other kind of side effect. Um, when we talk about CRV spin-offs, people who would and yourself included uh, would do this practice regularly. Started to have uh, wider psychological effects from it. Right. Um, you know the thing is, if you 
if you learn to speak to your subconscious mind and converse with it and interview with it, it not only knows what's going on over in the Kremlin, it also knows why you do those things you don't want to do, but you do them anyway, and why you don't do the things that you want to do, but they never get done. Uh, it knows where you left your car keys. Um, it, uh, it, it knows how to give you the information that it would take 10 years on a psychiatrist's couch to find out. Um, you know, because I mean, it's right there inside of you. It it knows the mucky muck of what's going on, and um, and once you learn to communicate with it, you can simply task yourself any problems that you have as a target, and get the answer. You know, in thirty minutes, you have the answer. Um, so, I mean, I would never teach this to somebody as a self help thing because it takes sometimes years to learn it'd be like joining the marines to learn how to fold your underwear you know uh but it's um it's it's, it's not limited no. to yeah. quote psychic work and uh that's where so if people who do sort of regular sigil magic which is, is you know a variant in a way of what we're talking about experience yeah. the same effects there is something there's an holistic consciousness, if you will, has a uh, has a, a sort of profound effect on your life. And what fascinates me about that is that's kind of the promise of Jungian depth psychology whilst Jung was alive. Uh, but yeah. in the intervening mm -hmm. years, psychology, like for reasons that escape me, went down that uh, materialist perspective. Uh, I, I, I guess to try to demonstrate legitimacy or so on. So this this idea of engaging with your unconscious having wider beneficial effects in your life was left to kind of manifest in the strangest yeah. of places like uh like the cold war you know yeah it's uh and, and you know one of the things that that uh has happened is that um in the military we use this to save lives to to find out new scientific developments that were going on in other countries to protect um the u.s uh to um protect soldiers and uh to capture drug lords all of this we've done all of this and i get onto a radio or tv show and they say tell me about ufos yeah <laughs> <laughs> ah! and uh you know they always go for the uh for the one sensational thing, it's, I don't know if you'll use this on the, on your show or not, but, um, uh, there's an old thing, you know, in history that, uh, Adolf Hitler killed over a million Jews and one clown. No, I've never heard that before. Oh, really? No. Yeah, most people, most people say, and a clown. I have never heard anybody say, a million Jews. <laughs> yeah, right. I see. <laughs> they go for the one thing. <laughs> yeah. I but see, and, and yeah. it's that way, you know. You you have all of this military protection, giving us keeping us our freedom, and and they tell me about a UFO, you know. <laughs> well, that, but that's that's protecting the belief system again. That's the same as people saying. Or just outright denying it, because if you That's if true. you open yeah. with "Tell me about a UFO," what they're really saying is, "Let me see how crazy you really are," because then I don't have to yeah. modify my worldview to to include. And to be clear, I mean, I've I a huge, I have massive interest in in the topic of you know um, unexplained aerial phenomena and the extra dimensional oh, sure. and so yeah. on. Like it, it is not to pretend that it isn't a reality it's just that that's not the topic under discussion and if you get asked that question one it is because the journalist or whoever wants to open with this guy um got government money to talk to aliens on the back of the moon ha <laughs> ha that's right and, yeah know, that's uh -huh. you're just protecting your belief system there to be fair yeah. i mean as we know and we kind of talk around it when the information about these uh, programs became available in the mid-90s. 
the early days of that process could have gone a lot better, uh, mm-hmm. to say the least. And that's where there's still some sort of residual UFO uh, component uh, to that. But as you say, it's it's not the most interesting thing, particularly on the, the kind of East Coast side of things, because uh, you guys, you mentioned this, but you weren't working blind. These weren't clinical trials. They, they were live examples. So the, the sort of yeah. the process well, was very different. We were actually working blind. Um, they would never tell us what the target was. And uh, uh, even they even stopped giving us geographic coordinates. They would, uh, this is an oversimplification, but they would say like, this is project 970404, question three, what's the answer? But they would keep us totally blind to what we were viewing so that our imagination and logic didn't get in the way. But um, they were real targets. They weren't laboratory targets they were they were actually real things and real people and real lives involved yeah uh when it, let's uh, <laughs> let's talk about a couple of them then so um uh, what's it like being inside a particle beam <laughs> it was the most beautiful thing i have ever seen in my life um uh, uh the uh particle beam well it, for those yeah, tell the story. It's it's yeah. amazing. It's incredible. Um, they they the Russians were developing this particle beam weapon, and um, some of our scientists or researchers or someone I never found out who was doing the tasking wanted to find out what goes on inside the beam of the particle beam weapon, and of course anything you stick in there just vaporizes within microseconds. And so somebody had the brilliant idea of, well, let's stick a remote viewer in there (laughs) and uh, have somebody remote view it. And that seemed to me, they came out and um, on this one, we knew what it was because they explained it uh, because there might be danger to the viewer. And I thought it was just the neatest thing. So I volunteered for it and um, uh, started the session, got what was called. uh, by location where you mentally you are experiencing the target as though you're standing right there at it. You can't tell you're not at the target. And uh, then I stepped into the beam. And inside the beam, time is just all screwed up. Um, also, the colors that I was seeing and the... Uh, the patterns and and everything uh, just it was the most beautiful thing i have ever indescribably beautiful um when when that session was over i realized that they didn't care about how beautiful it was they wanted to know what was going on in the beam and so i wrote out a report of what was going on in the beam and they were evidently very happy they learned something from it but for me, it was an experience of beauty that that uh, I can remember, but I can never fully explain. Uh, just totally indescribable. And why do you suppose you experience the the time effects? I mean, does that have something to do with light? Do you suppose? No, I think that the time itself is actually all screwed up inside the particle beam itself. Um, First of all, you have things going at the speed of light. Yeah. Um, and, um, and you know, it's just, um, and a particle beam tends to take all molecules, even air molecules, along with it and so on. And uh, so I think that is part of the nature of a particle beam weapon. I, I reported that and... Uh, Nobody ever came back and said you're you're Looney Tunes. You know, <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> well, you mentioned time, uh, Lynn. What's door knobbing? Huh. Uh, door knobbing. Um, uh, that was actually named after a uh, one of my first sessions. They gave me a historic house, and for feedback after the session. We went out to the house to actually see the place instead of just getting a picture of it. 
Um, and I was describing this house and this kitchen and all that. And all of a sudden, I saw this humongous diamond. And uh, it was a clear diamond. I drew it on the paper. And here I was in the in the uh, viewing building there at Fort Meade and um, and drew all the facets and everything else. Well, we went out after the session. The monitor said, uh, uh, you almost had the target, but then you missed it when you started viewing this diamond. We went out there and we walked up onto the porch of this his historic house and the doorknob was one of these crystal doorknobs. And I had my session papers with me and I held it up. The sketch I had drawn was the same size as the doorknob. It had all the same facets and all the same patterns. I had gotten 100% accuracy on this doorknob. But they had to teach me the lesson of not being distracted by something that interests me when you're doing operational sessions and people's lives depend on it. And so he said, okay, you did 100% accuracy, accurate viewing, but the target was the house. So I got a zero for it. Yeah. it <laughs> and uh, okay. it was a good lesson. You know, it yeah. was a good lesson that uh, do what you're told to do. You're, this, you're in the service. You're in the military. Do what you're told to do. There is something, I think, topologically significant about the fact that there are either um, exciting objects in space or time uh, can direct a viewer. I mean, the, the famous example is something like... Um, if you try to if you try to re remote view something a block from ground zero, that's going to be very yeah. difficult. Uh, yeah. and, and it's the that kind of thing I think is something really really interesting about how space time works, and also from a protective capacity. Uh, I know you mentioned in the book that um, if you put exciting and bizarre objects up around an office in in a classified environment, that's a reasonably good way. If if not fully protecting, then it's kind of like uh, anti-aircraft fire, like uh, you, you're you going to make it more difficult for, for people to find the actual classified things. That's right. Uh, Joe McMonigle one time had a target of a um, uh, high-level military meeting in a foreign country. And uh, part of his uh, <laughs> part of his description were that was that uh, this building on the lower level was a place where business was conducted one on one and in order to use these attractors because the are distractors because the russians do know about remote viewing uh they did have it before we did um they had they had uh, the generals had held their meeting on the top floor of a um brothel and Joe had described the, you know, the business downstairs is a uh, uh, business where business is conducted one on one. <laughs> and uh, uh, but we knew about these distractors. One of the um, tests that we would give to see a viewer's training progress would be um, Pearl Harbor the day before the attack. And uh, if the viewer had not learned to follow the tasking to the exact letter, they would be drawn off to the attack. Uh, but if they, once they learned, hey, I don't care what's there, you do the target, um, then they would get this quiet, peaceful day, you know. Yeah. And there's uh, some suggestion that the Russians and the Chinese would do things like have classified facilities next to things like a carnival with with lights and loud si like si sounds and so on, so that this oh, yeah. kind of throws up the distractions. Yeah, they still do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a proven technique. Uh, if you if you have someone who's not well trained, 
you know, with this specific training to always go for the target, then uh, that's a very effective method. Um, Do you know what a witch's bottle is, Lynn? A witch's bottle? No, I yeah. don't. Uh-uh. It's uh, it's gross, but I'll tell you. So um, historically, you would protect a house like a witch from witches, or a witch would use it by uh, getting um, fingernails and urine and and rusty nails and and general disgusting sharp um, icky oh, things. Yeah. Stick it in mm-hmm. a bottle and bury it. Uh, either underneath your kind of front door or elsewhere away from the house. And if you consider that in the context of this sort of topological distraction or or kind of anti-aircraft cover, this comes back to what I was saying about magic potentially having magic being a descriptor of natural consciousness effects and it, yeah it, it, and working it, working better in practice than in yeah theory. exactly yeah yeah <laughs> but it sort of begs the question about things like gargoyles and and their use in in uh protecting things like churches and and so yeah. on there's this um what interests me well the whole thing interests me but what um the remote viewing project represents which is why it's so disappointing when people ask you about ufos is um sort of uh, verified in-field data to contextualize the kind of wider human experience and and I and I think this sort of the the fact that you can be distracted in space or time by an event like this is is hugely significant for what space time really is that's right yeah uh yeah we we had um, attractors and distractors that we had to teach people to guard against, but we also had what we call temporal attractors and temporal distractors that um, that were included in the training because you can be drawn off in, in space and time, uh, just like uh, the day before Pearl Harbor attack, you would be drawn off in time to the later day. Yeah, it's... a. Uh... I mean, sort of, I guess, speaking in the of the wider implications, you write about uh, using the, the process or remote viewing as people were transitioning to the other side. So do you want to kind of talk about your um, CRV-derived experiences of, of something like that? <laughs> yeah, um, it was kind of hard on me, but um, what they found out in my training that I just would shy away from death. I would not view death or death situations. And of course, when you're dealing with battlefield conditions, you're going to have that. And um, so one of the other viewers who um, we took turns monitoring each other and picking targets for each other, um, he gave me a series of targets where uh, I would access a person mentally. And this was one of my fortes. Uh, I would access a person mentally and then he would say, okay, we'll move forward one day or move back one day and, you know, move me through time. And he would have data that would show what happened with this person. But then the people that he picked were always people who had died. And he would move me forward through the moment of death, still hanging on to this person. and. Uh, I never found a ghost. If we had had a larger sampling of people dying, you know, uh, I may have wound up viewing a ghost, but I never viewed a ghost. Um, I viewed that some people go to what I would call heaven, uh, total bliss, you know, the the tunnel of light and all this other stuff. And some people go to what I would call hell. I mean absolute total horror some people would suddenly be a 12 or 13 year old kid uh they would actually reincarnate some people would just quit existing and now i was raised in the baptist church where you either go to heaven or hell and what it what dawned on me after this whole series of things where I had learned to view death was that um, the reincarnationists are right, the Baptists are right, the uh, uh, atheists are right, 
what they're doing wrong is saying that everybody else doesn't believe in the way they do, and so they've got to be wrong. When they're all getting different possibilities that actually exist. Yeah, blind men and the elephant. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the quid existing one is interesting. I, I don't understand how that would work unless we have a model of a universe where people can either um, have their soul leave their body, which is very shamanic, um, prior to their death, or they can incarnate without one because you kind of wonder, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Um, yeah, I, I never figured this out. And, uh, many times I would go back and, you know, for feedback, I would get who the person was and, and, uh, be able to see what they did and how they died and all this other stuff and would be able to judge my session and score it for accuracy and all. Um, what I never found out was what kind of life leads to what kind of afterlife. And yeah. that always puzzled me. Uh, I never have found the answer, actually. No, it's uh, it's it's certainly one for, for further research or contemplation. But um, so, yeah. Lynn, we've had we've had a bunch of military stories. What about a story from once you were back in civilian land? Uh, what about a student story from out in the real world that uh, that from someone who's learned CIV from you or so on that, that got back oh, in contact okay. and said, "Oh my goodness, what about? Like, I have to tell you this, Lynn." Yeah, um, one of my students, um, I'll just give his first name, Michael, um, has gone through all of the training, all of the levels of training, and uh, practices like you want all of your students to practice. You know, he actually actually does it. And um, so the um, uh, International Remote Viewers Association last year had a contest, a psychic spying contest, and uh, they asked me to get a target. Well, back in the very beginning of the project, Joe McMonagle had received a picture of the roof of a building, and he was tasked to find out what was going on inside the building and do a timeline and, and what was taking place and over what period of time, and to do a floor plan of the building and so on. All he had was a picture of the roof. And so there is a building here. Uh, it's called the uh, the Boneyard. It um, is where the, the local space museum gets in all of their wrecked spaceware and, uh, you know, downed missiles and crashed missiles and uh, um, space capsules and all that. And refurbish them and send them out to different museums and i volunteered i volunteered for several years working in that building working on the on the space debris and all that and so i got on google earth and took a picture of the top of the building and uh i said you know okay the task for the psychic spy in your contest is tell us what's going on inside the building, what the building is used for, draw a floor plan of the building, telling what each room is for, what is done, describe the people working in there, what they're doing, everything else, everything you can. And um, Michael got, uh, I think it was a 94% accuracy on that and uh, won the contest. They had 12 people enter only two of them were uh, CRVers, and both of those had very accurate um, uh, reports. Um, Michael also drew the floor plan of the inside of the building very accurately. Um, the other CRVer, I think, had an accuracy level of almost 80%, but... Um, um, Michael, of course, won the contest. There was a thousand dollar prize, but from just a picture of the roof of the building, he was able to describe the people inside, what they were doing. He described the equipment. He described all of the uh, 
the space debris. And in fact, there was a, um, uh, we had the fuel tank of the Delta Clipper, uh, the first actual manned spaceship that we could have had. And uh, uh, he drew it accurately. Uh, and he, in fact, he drew it with one of the people who worked there showing my godson uh, and my godson looking up at this humongous tank and with his arms up. And I actually had a picture of that that I could provide for feedback. Um, so his accuracy was just phenomenal. Just from, just from saying, you know, okay, here's the roof of a building. Yeah, that's very impressive. Tell me, <laughs> tell me everything. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Lynn, uh, I mean, this has been an amazing conversation, and thank you so so very much for your time. For the people who are listening, who obviously would like to know more, because who doesn't? Uh, where would they go to get such information? Uh, my website is C R V I E W E R C R Viewer dot com. Um, uh, the training section. I have stopped training in-house and traveling to train, um, and I'm developing online video uh, training. And uh, uh, so there's an in, there's an area there for training that um, will point you toward the students that have had who have become fantastic trainers of their own. And... Um, I, I have no business connection to them, but I gave them all the manuals, uh, everything, and they all teach exactly the same thing. You can go to one for basic level. You go to another for intermediate level, and it's a straight continuation. Uh, they're all teaching the military methodology. Um, there's also the book. Um, uh, the Seventh Sense, and in the back of that book, in the appendices, we have the six exercises that we make all students do and hope they do once they get home um, that will, will hone your abilities, even if you never get training, will hone your, hone your abilities to the point where it actually does change your life for the better. Uh, that's a second so a, endorsement for that book. Um, I I own it. I've had it for years, and uh, the oh. appendices the appendices are definitely definitely worth the price of admin. Let alone the amazing story that precedes it. Yeah, I tried to um, I tried to just tell what happened in the military, and um, you know uh, what we used it for, what we did, and some of my own experiences. Uh, um, I didn't try to. Uh, teach or explain anything else uh so it's a it's a it's a book that just says here's what it is here's how it happened and you know well uh, yeah it's uh i hope i hope the reader finds it interesting <laughs> oh absolutely well uh and i hope and i'm sure um they found this conversation interesting so lynn once again this has been amazing i've been looking forward to this and uh thank you very much for your time well, thank you for your interest in, and for inviting me. I've really enjoyed talking about this. I hope we can all agree that went pretty well. Uh, for me, the highlight was absolutely bringing the remote viewing conversation and its data into our ongoing quest for the restoration of context, particularly around what the reality of the phenomena might imply for traditional practices. And in that sense, or, or, or kind of because, uh, McKenna's If It's Real, It Can Take the Pressure works backwards on our own experiences and experiments, which is to say uh, your preferred explanatory model, which Lynn and I kind of touched on in the context of remote viewing, still has the same burden of proof as any other. And for those of you looking to go deeper with remote viewing, uh, Lynn's book is certainly near the top of the list. I do, of course, recommend it, along with Dr. Targ's The Reality of ESP. So they're certainly worth checking out. And speaking of checking out, please visit the podcast supermarket checkout of your choice. I'm not sure where I'm going with this metaphor, but uh, subscribe to the show so I never have to use it again.
Uh, also find Rune Soup at uh, runesoup.com on Facebook and find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.